And so we are going uh, verse by verse through the book of Acts, and we are uh, the fourth Sunday of this new year. Uh, And these past few weeks, we have kind of been laying out a foundation for what the next 12 months of our church is going to look like, even stretching on between uh, beyond 2024. And I truly believe God wants to stretch us uh, beyond our current circumstances and step into the plan and vision God has for us. And not just us, but for the people around us, that we are standing in the gap for those in our circle. I truly believe through prayer that our God is going to do powerful things in the lives of our family members, our neighborhoods, our city, and our world, aligning us with what I believe the, the, the two words are for this year. The first word for this year we have talked about for the past few weeks is grow. That the children of God, that be you and I, aspiring to savor the goodness of God in every moment. That wherever you find yourself, wherever difficulty or valley or mountain arises, you wake up with the desire to go, God, I'm going to find you in this. I'm going to taste you in this, and I'm going to know that you are good, even in the hard times. And I truly believe when we start to do that every day, seeing our God redeeming our circumstances, it'll lead to the second word, to go. We're the children of God, you and I, embrace the longing for others to experience the goodness of God regardless of the path it may lead them. That's where these three things that we're praying for, that it will lead you maybe to a house that you haven't been to in years, knocking on the door to be greeted by a father who has wounded you, a mother who has hurt you, a friend or a family member, and that you, so longing For them to know God, you step into a place where God can grow you and them in the gospel. I truly believe that when we see this, that this will be a year where we align to the purposes and plans of the gospel. Taking part in seeing that repentance begins to be proclaimed in the name of the Lord to all nations, you and I, a part of that plan. See, when men and women begin to focus on seeing the name of Jesus proclaimed to all nations, the world began to change. The church was founded, and for 2,000 years, God was weaving the cord of the gospel through generation after generation to this Sunday, to last Sunday, when the church gathered. I thought it was kind of neat. I had a meeting with um, a church member this week. She is um, she is older. Uh, she uh, in uh, she is up in years, and we're having conversations. And we were just talking about for the for the seventy years of her life, God has just been moving and using her. Um, and, and we were as we were talking through this, we we got off on a uh, on a young girl in her early thirties who she's pouring into. And we were just talking about how excited to see uh, this, this, this older um, 70-year-old lady pouring into this, to this younger 30-year-old lady. Uh, this younger 30-year-old lady is just newly married and excited about the gospel and excited about discipling people. And I started to think how, how neat that was. It really hit me that this is how God has worked through the entire lifespan of the Christian church. A more mature believer pouring into a less mature believer. And in the span of this less mature believer growing into a mature believer, the wisdom, the knowledge, the the, the outpouring that that God has instowed on this older believer lives on in the life of this younger believer. And so for the next 40 years, As she goes from 30 to 70, the wisdom that has been poured into this older lady lives on even after this older lady is 
worshiping Jesus in heaven. And God has done that year after year, generation after generation. His truth proclaimed, his belief passed on. And Luke unpacks that in this uh, verse, chapters 3 through 11. Though he's unpacking the events of the Christian, uh, of Christ's appearance after his resurrection, he's giving his audience the important ground level. Uh, information that we, you and I, still build on today. So uh, we already had it read over, Elder Deacon D- Stephen read over, so I'm just going to jump around in my sermon today, but let me just give you some verses for context as I pull small snippets out that you and I can grow in. Uh, the first, let's start here. He says, so the same apostles also, after his suffering, he presented himself, being Jesus, alive with many convincing proofs. He was seen by them over a 40-day period and spoke about the matters concerning the kingdom of God. Let's stop here for a moment. See, establishing the foundations of our faith wasn't going to be an easy one, ladies and gentlemen. The starting of the church, the advancement of the gospel would take these men and take these women to unfamiliar lands. For these men and these women, they would find themselves in prison. And for many of them, would lead to their deaths. See, assurance in their message was vital. They needed to know that he was alive. They needed to know that he kept his promise because he said that he would come back. And if our God kept his promise and came back, back, then he would keep all his other promises that he has made. See, the sheer fact that our God was seen by so many people over a long period of time is powerful proof. Think about this. In one passage in Luke 24, like when Thomas comes into the room, he says, dude, touch my wounds. They Saul, he was alive. Point number one for you and I is this. Our faith has a foundation in a risen Savior. See, the Bible is the word of God. It is breathed out by God. But the miracle of Christianity, the foundation in which you and I rest on, is that we have a God who is no longer in the grave. We have a God who has risen. The resurrection of Jesus is so powerful. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He says this, And if if Christ has not been raised, your faith is useless. And you are still in your sins. Furthermore, all those who have fallen asleep, all those who have died in Christ have perished. For only in this life we have hope in Christ. Uh, We should be pitted more than anyone else. But then he says this, but now Christ has been raised from death. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And since death came through one man, the resurrection of the dead also came through one man. For just as Adam, the first man ever created, sinned, Uh, Just as Adam all died, so also in Christ all will be made alive. See, ladies and gentlemen, the resurrection is already but not yet reality for you and I. Let me say that again. Our resurrection is a reality and a not yet reality for us as Christians. See, Jesus being alive means that those who have faith in him has been raised from the dead, not because of their goodness, but because of his. And yet still, you and I await this experience of resurrection, as Hebrews 8, 22 through 23 tells us. The eyewitness account of Jesus being alive gave them boldness to preach the gospel. And here's the crazy part. Gave them boldness to preach the gospel to the very people who crucified Christ, who in an instant 
brought him before, made a mock trial, and had him executed. These men, these women became emboldened. Why? Because they had seen the risen Savior. And their boldness is passed on to you and I. Why? Because we have a God who is alive. Not just a God who is alive. On top of that, you and I have a Holy Spirit, a Holy Spirit in which he passed on to us. Go on to the rest of the verse. We'll jump over to another section. It says this, for John baptized with water, but you would be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Point number two I want you to get. Our faith has supernatural power, not from within us. I love that Jesus tells them that the Holy Spirit is going to come on them. There's two ramifications for this. The first is they're not alone. You and I are not alone. You and I have a Holy Spirit that has been breathed out on us. And whatever we face and whatever this world throws at us, you and I are not alone. The second thing is, it's not done in our own strength. We have a power that comes from the Holy Spirit. Like, put yourself in the disciples' shoes for a moment. Let's put our minds, let's go back there to that moment. Okay, you've been hanging out with this guy for three years. This guy is doing miraculous miracles. He is proclaiming to be God. You believe he is God. Now he dies. He is, you then are scattered. You run away. You hide. And then three days later, the guy that you have been hanging out with for three years who have proclaimed to be God, who was murdered, comes back to life just like he said he would. Then for the next 40 days, You hang out with him. You physically touch his wounds. You see all of these different things. I don't know about you, but I would be pretty excited. I would be like kicking down the gates of hell with like a super soaker. Like, let's do this thing. And I would try in all my mind, and I would be tempted to do it in my own strength, ladies and gentlemen just pumped and excited in my own strength. This is a hard reality for you and I to have to get. All the preparation, all the training, all the knowledge, all the experience that you can bring to the table is useless without the proper power that comes from him. Let me say that again. All the books that you've read, all the Bible studies you have attended, all the, all the Sunday school classes that you have done, all the trainings and conferences you have gone to is useless unless you tap into the power in which he supplies. See, our earthly battle is presence over performance. This is where you and I struggle This is where we wage war. God, I got this. I can do it. I know all these different things. I can make it happen. And God goes, no, 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 no. Just just sit with me. Sit with me. Be with me and see what I can do. This this word, uh, we have a a, a dynamite power inside us. That word for power that we saw in this verse, that you will receive power, is dunamis. It's the, the Greek word where we get dynamite for from. So you have dynamite power resting inside of you because of the Holy Spirit, and you still try to do it on your own with your little matches, little try to strength, whatever you have. And this is where we must fight for presence. See, when we press into his presence, we release that power. See, we release it by being controlled and led by the Spirit. But for most of us, we're not tapping into his power. We're tapping into our own emotions. Anyone else ever stepped into their own emotions and blown everything up in their face? I was, uh, I was watching a, um, a, a real... Someone sent me 
and was a um, is a gender reveal party, one of those little clips. And so there's this big balloon, helium balloon. I assume it had some sort of pink or blue confetti because there's only two gender, but we'll leave that there. Um, not multicolor. Um, and so in the midst of this, they're, they're, they get the, 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 the cameras on, and so they hand the, the, the little uh, scissors or whatever to their, to their oldest daughter, and, and she goes to try to pop the balloon, and she doesn't do it, and she starts to just throw a royal fit because she can't do it. And she's screaming, and she's crying, and it's like, kick that child in the face. And it just was one of those things where it just, she was just, and then she takes the scissors, and she like chunks them at the people who are watching. And um, just pitching a fit, and the mom's holding the balloon. The mom turns to discipline her child, letting go of the balloon to talk to her child, and the balloon just floats off into the sky. Why do I tell you that story? One, because it's hilarious. Uh, for us, not so much for the mom. Um, but two, because at this point in time, uncontrolled emotions blow up in your face. You need to fight for the presence of God on a daily basis, ladies and gentlemen. And you may be sitting here, okay, pastor, I get it. Like, okay, I, you know, I've experienced what you're talking about in my own life. I understand that. But pastor, like, I still got a bunch of questions. And, and, and I know you, you're telling me that I'm a part of this mission, that God has a plan for me, and God wants to use me as he has been using other believers for the last 2,000 years. But, but I got a lot of questions that I don't know has answers. And it makes me a little uncomfortable and, 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 what I, and, and maybe a little out of place. And what I would tell you is you are in perfect company. Your pastor has questions. The disciples had questions. Look, look at the rest of the verse. He, they begin to ask him questions. It says, so when he gathered together, they begin to ask him questions. Lord, is this the time when you are restoring your kingdom to Israel? And he told them, you are not permitted to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. Like, think about this. The disciples had met with Jesus. He had been risen for 40 days. They were hanging out with him. John gives us some backstory in this. In John chapter 20, verse 30, it says, Now Jesus performed many other miraculous signs in the presence of the disciples that weren't even recorded in these books. So he's done all this miraculous things. They're in his presence, and they still go... Well, God, I got questions. I got to ask you questions. You got to give me some answers. And I love Jesus' response here. Nope. <laughs> you don't get them. Point number three I want you to get is this. Our faith, you and I, is filled with certainties and uncertainties. See, Christians need to quit beating around the bush Acting like we have everything figured out, ladies and gentlemen. We gotta quit acting like it. We don't. Our own Savior told us that we will not have all of the answers. There's proof after proof after proof that our God is real and He is moving in our lives, but there are still things you and I just don't know. And we need to be okay with that. And we need to trust God that he's got this. Um, back in 2022, uh, my family and I went to Tennessee to see my in-laws. That's where they live. Um, and um, we're on the side of the mountain, and there's this big river on the side of the mountain. And there's big boulders, uh, not sand, boulders. I know you Floridians don't understand this, but like a boulder is a big rock. Um, and so there's like these big rocks. And, and so me and the kids are kind of like hopping from like rock to rock in this like river and, and things. And, you know, and so I'm like, oh, this is cool. And there's this little waterfall from these boulders and this rushing river. And so we're getting close and looking over the edge and stuff. And out of nowhere, I'm, I'm going from rock to rock. And then all of a sudden, like, I'm not on the rocks anymore. 
Like I'm in the middle of this river, like completely soaked, like like I'm about to drown here type situation. Luckily, the only thing bruised was my ego. Um, and what seemed like a solid foundation was slippery ground. The Christianity that tells you to blindly trust, to never ask questions, the Christianity that tells you to pretend that everything is perfect and to never show weakness, the Christianity that, that tells you to never act like you don't have every answer is slippery ground, ladies and gentlemen. Slippery ground. Many Christians act this way. And here's the crazy thing. Many of us act like we got it all together, that we have all the answers, that we can answer it, because we don't want Christianity to look weak. Our own God told us, you're not going to have all the answers. And at the end of the day, Christianity's weakness or strength isn't hinged upon your knowledge. It's hinged upon a risen Savior, ladies and gentlemen. And we have a risen Savior. So what I would challenge you to do is ask all the questions you can. Seek all the answers that are available. And then, much like the disciples, believe God will reveal in his time the rest. And if someone who is not in the faith, because as we are praying through these things, people are going to ask you questions. If someone comes up to you and your biggest, some of your biggest, I can'ts, why can't you share your faith? Well, pastor, I can't because what if they ask me a question I don't know? <laughs> Great. <laughs> Look at them and go, I don't know that answer. I don't know that answer. Let me pray about it. Let me see if I can find an answer. And let me see if our God has revealed an answer to you. But here's, you know what? I may not be able to answer that question, but I can't answer this. We have a God who is alive. He is living and active inside me. He has changed my life. And I truly believe he can change yours as well. It'll be a powerful, powerful year. Let's move on and look at the rest of verse 8. It says this, And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and into the farthest parts of the earth. Point number four is this. Our faith has a purpose and a mission. You will be my witnesses. We are all witnesses. The questions we should be asking ourselves is this. How effective of a witness are you? Right? If the church is to reach the lost world with the good news of the gospel, we have to do as 1 Peter uh, 3.15 tells us. But set Christ apart as Lord in your hearts and always be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks about the hope you possess. But set Christ apart as Lord in your hearts. See, a lot of people want Christ to be Savior, not Lord. God, I want you to allow me to go to heaven, but I don't want you to tell me what to do. I read a quote from a pastor, and it said this, A person who fears the Lord will obey God's word, even if it's not personally beneficial. Our God has a purpose for his church, a mission for us to complete, and our lives should fall in step with that. Why? Because of the last verse. Look what it says. As they were staring, uh, they were still staring into the sky while he was going, suddenly two men in white clothes stood near to them and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come back. Point number five, and I leave it on this. Our faith has a Savior who is returning. Our faith has a Savior who is returning. Our God is coming back. It's a pretty compelling motive to be about the father's business when we know that the father is sending his son to come collect his children one day. 
I want to end with this quote. You and I have hope no matter what. Because God's word is true. His presence is constant. His power never weakens. And his grace never runs out. Ladies and gentlemen, that is a quote to build a movement on. I don't care what you have faced. I don't care what you have done. I don't care what you've not done. I don't care what you have believed. I don't care what you have questioned. I don't care what you've openly rejected in the past. I don't care if you stumbled in here this morning embarrassed for how you lived last night. I don't care if you're trying to hide behind your phony perfection church face. I don't care how many wounds you have. All I care about is that you and I know we have a God whose word is true, whose presence is constant, whose power never weakens, and his grace never runs out. I don't know where you are, but rest in that today. Rest in that today that we have a God whose grace never runs out and he is pursuing you. He longs to use you. 2024 is going to be a great year when we rest in that. Let me pray for us.